What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to the second live episode of Surviving the Survivor for Thursday, September 7th. Of course, it is the podcast that brings you the very best guests in true crime and none better than tonight's panel. I seem to say that every day, but every day it is, in fact, a true statement. Um, we continue tonight our coverage of the notorious serial killer Dennis Rader, uh, who called himself BTK for how he murdered his victims by binding, torturing, and killing them. Kerry Rawson, uh, she was on our show last week. She is Dennis Rader's daughter, told us she believes her father could be responsible for at least five more murders. And tonight, we have two more possible victims' names, Carol Marlene Sullins and Mary Georgine Lang, and we're going to talk about them in just a moment. BTK is now the prime suspect in two unsolved killings, one in Oklahoma and another in Missouri of a young woman, uh, Cindy Kinney, who is just uh, 16 years old, and Shauna Garber, uh, who went missing as well. Uh, leading authorities to dig a few weeks ago near Kerry's childhood, childhood home in Park City, Kansas. And it's not just the victims making news. We're also seeing new sketches from BTK of both barns and silos, which investigators hope are going to jog memories of possible witnesses. And tonight on our program, the legend is back. Dr. Ann Burgess is here. She's an internationally recognized pioneer in the assessment and treatment of victims of trauma and abuse and the author of A Killer by Design, Murders, Mindhunters, and My Quest to Decipher the Criminal Mind. And uh, among her many awards and accolades in 2016, she was literally named a living legend by the American Academy of Nursing. The show Mindhunter on Netflix is loosely based on her work, Dakota Fanning is making a docu-series right now as we speak. And you know, Anne is a big guest when you have Cheryl McCollum on, and Cheryl McCollum comes into the waiting room and goes, wow, I can't believe that's Anne Burgess. So that's pretty cool. So it's Cheryl unreal. McCollum, <laughs> uh, she is an Emmy Award-winning CSI, an active crime scene investigator who also does work with CBS 46 Atlanta. She's the director of the Cold Case Investigative Research Institute, uh, she works closely with Nancy Grace, as I said, uh, CSI for Metro Atlanta. She holds a master's degree in criminal justice. I called her a, a true crime nerd, kind of, and she is. <laughs> uh, she's the co-author of the textbook, Cold Case Pathways to Justice. <laughs> and last, but of course not least, Dr. Joni Johnston. I'm just going to say it right off the bat. Everyone says she looks like Ashley Judd. Ashley Judd wishes she looked like Joni Johnston. Uh, Joni Johnston is a forensic psychologist, a private investigator, and a crime writer, and is a practicing psychologist. She's worked in both medium and maximum security prisons. She is the author of Serial Killers, 101 Questions True Crime Fans Asks, and she hosts her own YouTube channel, Unmasking a Murderer. So a couple of things before we really get into it. Uh, number one, I'm going to scroll this. Uh, the COE is uh, got better things to do tonight, if you can believe that. So I'm going to be doing a lot of the uh, handiwork myself. I'm going to put up the Osage County, Oklahoma Sheriff's Office number. Let me go ahead and do that right now. It just might stay up there the entire show. And uh, that is the number. If anyone knows anything, the purpose of the show is to raise uh, public awareness. Of course, the Osage County Sheriff, is his name is Eddie Verdon. We're going to talk about him. But uh, just for the audience, so you know, uh, I got uh, a message from Kerry Rawson, the formidable, tireless worker, Kerry Rawson. Uh, she reached out about 1130 last night, and she said she really uh, needs help along with the investigator she's working alongside from the public, uh, which is one of the main reasons, as I said, that we are doing this show tonight. She's been working with investigators uh, for the last bunch of months, and uh, there's now new information about two new possible victims. Uh, mm -hmm. One is Carol Sullins, who spells her name with a K, K-A-R-O-L. And uh, she was an exotic dancer, last seen outside her job at a club. And I'm no, I know I'm pronouncing this uh, incorrectly, Galena or Galena, Kansas. Uh, she was speaking to a man outside who had a pickup truck with a camper shell. She went missing 
August 31st, 1991. She was 18 years old back then. Today, she would be 50 years old. And this is an official flyer uh, that mm. was um, put out there. And Carrie sent these to me last night. So uh, <laughs> take a long, hard look for those of you in the Midwest and see if any of this jogs your memory. We'll come back to that. And then the other possible um, victim is Mary Georgine Lang. And there is a flyer and a photo of her. Uh, she went missing from Hayes, Kansas, back on October 21st, 1983. Uh, she was a secretary for a local attorney in town. She was on her way to deliver some papers. She went missing. Uh, back then, she was 31 years old. Today, she would be 70 years old. Uh, the first question to the living legend, Dr. Ann Burgess. Um, Ann, are you surprised that, uh, I guess, 18 years, almost 19 years since BTK confessed to the 10 murders, uh, fast forwarding all these years ahead, we're now talking about potentially five more victims and who knows how many more. I'm not surprised then. I don't think a lot of people would be. I know Bob Ressler, one of the quotes I remember him saying back in the 70s is he's never going to stop. We have to stop him. Right. So, and this is back when he was just known as B, um, BTK. It wasn't known as Dennis Rader. So definitely um, the, the feeling at the BSU at that time was they'd never seen anyone that had stopped. And they were all commenting on it. So I'm not surprised to hear that there is a possibility or at least other uh, possible victims maybe uh, of his, um, his handiwork, so to speak. Because it doesn't sound like he has changed very much from what I've been watching on the show. And uh, Dr. Ann, um, you know, you studied all serial, all types of serial killers, shy, sizes, shapes, size, colors. Um, where does Dennis Rader sort of fit on the, uh, you know, on the spectrum? It's a hard question because you never want to say, you know, are they a quote unquote good serial killer? But is he, um, you know, where, where do you place him um, in terms of his ability to uh, commit these crimes and, you know, the way he got away with it for so long? Well, that was the thing he got away with. It was very clever, very good, in, if you want to look at it from that standpoint, but certainly a sexual sadist, uh, just looking at the kinds of things he did. He, left, he liked to communicate with the media. That was one of the unusual features I remember back in the 70s and 80s, because they, they were, uh, VSU was contacted once in the 70s, and then they came back to him in the 80s after I guess there had been some more communication, but he was, he, they had no prototype for him. That was what was so unusual. Um, he did compare himself. He liked to compare himself evidently to other serial killers and uh, uh, son of Sam, David Berkowitz was the one that he talked about in his communications. They both identified themselves as quote monster. They both tried to communicate with the media. Uh, so from that standpoint, they're, was um, some similarity. So how would I classify him? Very dangerous, obviously. Serial killer, sexual sadist, narcissistic, your typical psychopath. But I, I remember after they did have information on him that he had a lot of other psychiatric kinds of situations. Like he had, I think, seven fetishes or seven identified fetishes that he had. And that he... Um, he had other kinds of psychiatric, if you will, diagnoses. So he was a much complicated type of serial killer. And so anything that comes up about him now is I'm not surprised to answer your first question. And I'm just getting a text message. I am paying attention. And someone yelled at me, when you have a best guest on, how dare you look down? Well, um, I just got a text message from Carrie uh, Rawson, who's telling me that the Wichita Police Department has now received a subpoena for BTK evidence. So things are, uh, he yeah, things are heating up even Good. as uh, Mac, uh, since you are uh, shaking your head there uh, and acknowledging what, what does that mean um, in essence uh, for those of us who are not mm -hmm. law enforcement agents? Well, I want to start with one other thing if I could, and I just want to piggyback on what Dr. Ann said. The most significant thing to me with BTK is he gave himself that moniker. 
he contacted law enforcement and used that nickname. By doing that, he gave you not only his MO, but his signature. So he wanted you to know what he was about. So that to me is critical. So when you start looking at evidence, he's told you, I'm gonna bind them. So any rope, any string, any handcuffs, duct tape, anything that he would use to hold that victim in place, you have to take that as seriously as anything else at that scene. Knowing that Wichita has some items in a glass case that they have preserved that's on display, one of them is a rope. You got to go get it. You got to know whose DNA is on it. So the fact that a subpoena has been granted, that's a big win. The fact that it's been served and now you're going to have, you know, probably four agencies that are going to be working together to understand what all this means and put some more pieces of this puzzle together in looking at these new victims and these new drawings. And that really stunned me. Uh, so I saw that photo. There's a kind of like a like a hall of fame, if you will, inside the Kansas mm -hmm. Bureau of Investigation. And they've got a uh, basically a noose in their case. And they think that it might be related to one of these new victims. Uh, Mac, is, is, is that uh, like a case of uh, hubris, uh, no humility? And they just did that. I mean, was that, should they have held that as just evidence for potential future cases? Should they be? flaunting it in a trophy case as, as they are. I can tell you, we do not look at it like flaunting at all. And it is preserved. It's not like people can open it and mess with it and touch it and carry on. But you have to understand that for these detectives, this is the biggest thing they will ever do in their career. So they don't want these things just sitting in a bag that could deteriorate, could get lost. This actually ensures this is going nowhere. So the guns associated with Bonnie and Clyde, the watch associated with Al Capone, you have to be sure these things are preserved. Just because it's somewhere in a glass case where the public can walk by it, to me, it's like the Smithsonian. There are things in the Smithsonian that are connected to crime that nobody balks at. A president was assassinated, and Jackie Kennedy's dress is right there. His shirt is right there. I think it should be. When you look at history of crime in America, I'm one of those people that champion, you need to look at it, you need to understand it so that we all have access to just the overall understanding and hopefully prevention of some of these things. Mac makes a fair point. Shout out to Angela Jacobs becoming a new YouTube member. Uh, I am not T. Payne for uh, the good doctor, doc Dr. Joni Johnston. Uh, she says BTK said his first torture fantasies, Dr. Joni, were in barns and silos. And we're going to show some sketches. Would a good place to look for silos he could have possibly taken victims to have been around where he grew up as a child? That's an interesting question. Would he go back to his childhood roots, Dr. Joni? I mean, I think it's certainly something to consider. And I also think it's important to look at his schedule, look at what the potential victims are. And, of course, try to figure out, are there similar um you know, structures that, that, that are like his drawings around where those victims disappeared. So I, I don't think you can rule out looking at some places where he was when he was a child. But again, I think they're trying at this point, my understanding is to tie the potential victims or the suspected victim, his suspected victims to these structures and these barns. And so I think they're probably going to and already have start with where these victims disappeared and kind of probably fan out from there. Lucy Bell on a uh, max last comment, right on Mac. And, uh, she made very interesting points. Um, back to you, Dr. Joni. Um, so one of the most difficult things here is, this is Kerry Rawson's father. Um, she went to visit him um, in prison a few weeks ago, and she told us that he sobbed. Um, how can, I mean, how difficult must it be for Kerry uh, to on the one hand be his daughter and on the other hand, investigating his crimes? What, what do you think, you know, she's dealing with that none of us can understand. I mean, those are just almost impossible hats to wear simultaneously, I think. I mean, she's serving as an objective investigator on the one hand, and yet she has these memories 
of her dad, taking her camping and taking care of her and those kinds of things. And so I can only imagine the conflict she must feel at times internally in terms of her feelings about him, in terms of her mission. And so, you know, I'm hoping, I know there, there's been a community around her, which I'm so happy to hear. I know she's working hard to take care of herself, Mac. You've played a key role in doing that. But I think it is going to be really important for her because, you know, trauma is really a, an unpredictable thing sometimes. Mm-hmm. And the way it can kind of hit you all of a sudden and you think you're doing fine and then one day you're not doing fine or a small thing happens and then you just topple down for a little bit. I think Carrie is amazingly resilient. She's a very strong person. I do think part of the healing for her is helping law enforcement. I think it helps her feel like she's more in control and she's doing some things to find some answers, but it really is a difficult time. And I can only imagine, you know, sitting with her father who she hasn't seen for 18 years, that there, there's a little girl inside her that remembers the good times. Um, and so it's got to be difficult to do what she's supposed to be doing, what she wants to do on the one hand, and this little girl who wants to kind of engage with her father in a very different way. Yeah, and she says he's in a pretty poor physical health. He went from five foot ten, five foot eleven to five foot two in a wheelchair from scoliosis, and that his mm-hmm. teeth are falling out. So it's you know that must be hard too. I watch my dad age, and it's still her father, so it must be uh, really tough. Uh, L Rose chiming in. Carrie said there's a knife in a cabinet somewhere that should be tested for DNA. So Carrie has invaluable uh, insight here. Uh, the Osage County Under Sheriff uh, Gary Upton said that quote unquote, Carrie has been a great help to law enforcement. She's helped us make sense of these journals and these timelines because she lived with him and knew a lot of his comings and goings. It took her a long time to come to grips with this part of her healing process. Her journey to healing has been in trying to help and we're letting her have it to whatever degree that she wants. And she is helping a lot. Um, so Dr. Ann Burgess, this is your world here. Um, I'm putting up some sketches and let me take this comment down. Um, so these are the most recent sketches. And um, from what we are learning, there have only been about 10 sketches drawn in color of, of over hundreds of sketches. And uh, it is believed that these sketches could have been drawn as the victims were actually dying, which is a, a little macabre and creepy. But uh, that is uh, nevertheless the truth. Uh, just, you know, off the top of your head, when you look at these, um, what are you seeing through your lens, which is much different than most of ours? Well, one of the interesting things about drawings, and I remember this from the discussion down at the Academy, is that uh, Harvey Glattman was a prototype to this. And he was a photographer who would lure uh, victims in by putting ads in the paper and saying, um, I, I need a model and so forth. And I he would get the women in and he would do exactly what you said. He would uh, photograph them in various stages. He'd tie them up and then he'd want them to make a fearful face. And of course, what he's doing all the time is scaring them and he ultimately would kill them. And he had, I think, three or four victims. Uh, This was out in, I think, the L.A. area. But at any rate, so I don't see this as being any, uh, this is certainly something that uh, Rader could have done also. He would have, uh, Glattman was probably 20, 30 years before him. So he may have even followed the case. So I think you have to look at them very carefully. Uh, I haven't seen them come up on my screen. I don't know if that's a, problem. I have seen them before. They, If I remember, there is one sketch which I was very interested in of a an older teen. Some of the ones I saw yes. were of really almost prepubescent, maybe might be eight, nine, ten years old. And then there was one that was, it looked like maybe a 12, 13, 14 year old. And she was standing in front of a, of a barn. And I know that that was a a curious thing. And he has talked about Barnes. Um, I'm not sure if the uh, agents had any of his sketches. I know they talked of having sketches and writings from him when they were still trying to profile him. So I think you have to look at these and just, they certainly represent his fantasies. Uh, Whether they also represent his victims, you'd only be able to know that if you had a victim that, there was enough evidence left to to determine whether it was the color of her hair, the color of her clothing. Um, I know that one was a very a blonde, a young uh, girl, really was a girl with blonde hair. And I think the other was, but they were bound. 
And they also had the uh, noose around the neck. That I thought was a rather uh, an important part to to um, to look at. Are, are you going to be showing them or? Uh, I, I, Dr. Joni, are you seeing them in Mac? I, I can see them. Okay. I can too. Okay. Yeah, okay. and I, it must be something with your settings, Ann, but they're up now. No. So I don't know. If, no. um, okay. Sorry, you I can't, can't see them. No, um, sorry. I know, I know that you have seen them. So, um, Dr. Joni, um, I mean, one of the things that really gives me goosebumps is that, um, and by the way, the young girl in green may be one of the current victims they're trying to connect to Dennis Rader. We're going to get into that in a moment. But um, the fact that it's been reported that he may have drawn these um, as the victims were dying, um, what kind of sadistic thrill um, is that for him? Is that what it's all about? What, what's behind drawing these people as you're killing them? Well, I think it is all about domination and control for him and certainly in a sexual way. Um, and I think it is the ultimate, you know, it is the ultimate control when you can. It is also, I think, another example of how he dehumanizes and objectifies his victims. He turns them into drawings. But I just wanted to add a couple of things, if you don't mind, Joel, that when Anne was talking, that just struck me about these pictures. A um, couple of things immediately. One is just I'm looking at these pictures and he, there's such emotion to me that he captures in these victims' faces. And I think that's part of the sexual turn on for him. I mean, I look at these faces and I think they're so hopeless looking and so afraid. And, you know, this is not a professional artist who's drawing this. And, you know, the, the drawings are, are fine from a quality standpoint, I guess, but he, he really does capture that for me. You know, one's looking off to the side. They're, the other, actually, they're both two of the two, ones on the side are both kind of looking off and they look hopeless. They look um, scared. They look frightened. And the other thing that kind of stood out to me is it just seems like he he's so much more invested in their dressing and what they're wearing and their clothes and the bindings than he is in these people as people. And, and it makes sense to me, given that he dresses like them at some point or takes photos of himself, binding himself and those kinds of things. So I think he does communicate a lot about his inner world with these drawings. Now, whether these are actual, they look like his victims, I don't know. I would not be surprised to find out that the clothes look like what the victims were wearing, because that's what I think he was focused on. The clothes that they were wearing and the emotions he was invoking in them, which was terror and fear and, and hopelessness. And Dr. Joni, what about the uh, color aspect here? Most of his sketches were like the middle, which is black and white. By the way, I could never draw this way. Uh, Kerry had mentioned in previous interviews uh, that he did study art at one point. These are pretty, um, you know, pretty elaborate. Uh, I, I'm a stick figure kind of guy, so I'm impressed by, you know, in terms of the art ability here. But what about the color factor um, is there a reason he'd be drawing certain uh, certain sketches in color and not others? Apparently, there's only 10 in color out of hundreds. Well, I remember years ago when I was in graduate school and we talked about, you know, the drawing a person and interpreting that. And there's been some research that's kind of raised some questions about that. But I think some of the things are still are still true. And one of them mm -hmm. is that color always represented feelings. So it represented fantasy. It represented pleasure a lot of times. So it had more emotion into it. So when you see the black and white, it's kind of like more of a detailed, this is my, this is what happened. This is what I did. This is my plan. This is how it turned out. But then you have the color, meaning this is how I'm feeling about this. This is exciting to me. This is vivid when I draw this. Uh, so Mac, um, Sheriff Eddie Verdon, who's the Osage County uh, Sheriff, uh, he, mm -hmm. he had a quote about the sketches. He says, someone might recognize one of these barns or the unique features in them. And I'm going to put up the uh, the other shots here, too, of, of the barns, if I can find them. Um, and can't find them at the moment, but I'll get them up there for you eventually. So um, he says, someone might recognize one of these barns or the, or the unique features in them or the closeness. Mm -hmm of the silo to the barn or possibly might have even found items that they didn't know they were there that could be very important in this case. He went on, uh, Sheriff Verdon, to tell CNN that this is a quote unquote very busy week with very good tips um, that have provided more information. Um, are you encouraged by the fact that these sketches are being released and that you're hearing the sheriff saying it's a very busy week? Absolutely. Listen, the short conversation that he and I had, he has hit the ground running. 
and he's inviting anybody that can help, whether it's a private citizen or an expert in some area. And here's the thing. All of us try really hard to stay in our lane. So I can't do what Dr. Ann and Dr. Joni do. But what I can do is if I see something, then ask them. Well, one thing that already stood out to me, and I had texted Carrie, you can tell he had training. Even just the way he shades, you're not going to do that unless you've had a class. So he doesn't have to be a great artist. He is conveying quite well what's going on in that picture. It is depicted perfectly to me. So when I start to look at things, again, Dr. Ann or Dr. Joni would be somebody that I would call because I don't know what it means. But here's what I see. He doesn't ever draw their hands, obviously, because they're bound. But he doesn't draw them before they're tied up. That's critical to me. He's letting you know something. He doesn't draw feet correctly or sometimes at all. Their hair is perfect. So they hadn't been fighting him. They hadn't been tussling. Those pigtails are perfect. Her bangs are perfect. Everything is in place. They are all gagged. Again, he told you in his nickname. He's laying it all out. So again, when I look at this and I say, okay, well, only one of them has ears. I don't know what that means. None of them have feet, hardly. They're not drawn correctly. None of them have hands. So I'm going to go to Dr. Joni and Dr. Ann, and I'm going to say, look, does this mean they're not fighting? Does this mean because they can't run away? To me, as horrifying as these pictures are, there is still an element of sexuality. They're wearing like this little baby doll dress. You can tell they don't have underwear on. In the middle black and white picture, her skirt's tucked up. So again, it's very sexual to me, even though it's horrifying. It's both of those things at the same time as a lay person. But as an investigator, I can tell you what I'd be looking for. And again, I want that rope. I want duct tape. I want the tarp. I want anything that's depicted in those pictures if I can find it. Someone just said, I love Max dialect, but I love her brain more. I got to agree. Although I do like that dialect. Um, Appreciate Dr. You. Joni, since uh, Dr. Ann's having a little hard time seeing the images, uh, this is the, uh, the barn we were talking about. Um, you can see the drawing on one side and then the flyer. They are, again, distributing these flyers to try to jog anyone's memory. Uh, that is the barn, and this is the silo, uh, and I'm going to go back to the barn. But what what do you see with your eyes here as a uh, as a psychologist? This this sketch looks a little more rudimentary, and there's a lot of writing on the side, which I'm not sure of what, what he's saying. Yeah, I'm, a little, I'm having a little bit of a hard time seeing this, and not because it doesn't it is on my screen, but I'm having a hard time seeing it yeah, it's um, fine. visually. Yeah. So, so I haven't seen them. I don't know, Mac, you might want to jump in here because I have not seen these up close or seen these where I can really make out what yeah. they are very well. These yeah, are, pretty these are the, the quality of the images, you know, the original images yeah. I don't think are yeah. great, but uh, go ahead, Mac, and I'll put up the other. I mean, I'll just say basically what Dr. Joni said er earlier. I think where they went missing from, yeah. if you go in a 10 mile radius, those would be the barns and silos I wanted to know about. How many are still standing? How many can I walk through? Again, some people may say a barn is a barn is a barn, but that's not true. Hay lofts are in different places. The doors are different. The windows are different. How they, if they have stalls or, you know, whatever they may be using it for. So these drawings, again, if you could find that place, he has done it to me almost to scale. In his memory, again, just like law enforcement, this is the biggest thing he's ever done. That's why he gave himself a nickname. That's why he took so much time and care and concern, you know, contacting law enforcement and that sort of thing. That's why when LISC happens, he has to contact the media and say, hey, I think he's my clone because it's look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And, he, you know, I don't think BTK ever would have been caught if he didn't taunt the media back in 2000. Or maybe he would have been caught, but not at the time that he was because uh, he was taunting the media. That's uh, a funny name with Mac on the show, Peach Tree Dishes, as opposed to Petri. I think it Carrie hope she's well. Um, and this is very interesting. Uh, so Carrie was on the show last week, and she said when she visited her father, she was asking him about the number of murders. Uh, the comment is from Rachel Fraker, what about the hand signs when he held up one and the zero? So um, Carrie said, you know, instead of doing this, he did this. Um, 
it was making the zero continuous. Um, what do you make of that? It was that his way of telling his daughter that there's more bodies out there, that it wasn't a stationary zero? Well, that certainly is one possibility. The other is that he, who would he tell? Uh, it has always been a question I had after so many years. Would he tell Carrie? Would, would that be who is a, certainly the closest person that we know of? Um, the other is, does she remember herself where they ever would go visiting barns or farms or something like that? In other words, it is a... Uh, uh, was that part of their growing up, part of his growing up? Uh, he talks about his childhood, and that's something I must have happened that, or could have happened, that triggered all of this. The other thing, just to go back to the sketches again, isn't there one, if you look at them and try to age them, certainly the young, there are young girls, and then there's that one that's older, and it matches the various ages. That was another unique aspect mm -hmm. i think to his victims is they were varying ages and they're obviously males and females so um w when you look at the sketches which we would assume i would assume that they are representing fantasies in his, in his mind and when did he draw them um before if, if they represent persons do they represent people he may have known in the community and was we know that he would stalk or surveil his victims ahead of time. So a lot of this could be discussed and kind of put together to see if indeed that this is a, and if the timing, the, again, go back to a timeline, when were these? Does this match anything that's in his, any of his writings? Things like that would be a way to kind of um, narrow down uh, this, because it looks like he's not going to say he did it, at least that's what Carrie tells us, that he denied it. So there's going to have to be some other way. He certainly is controlling the media and us again, if you will. So that his um, that was a characteristic of him back then, of how he controlled everybody, and, and, as well as victims. Yeah, and you bring up a, a very interesting point. And we have, I know you can't see the sketches uh, tonight, Ann, mm -hmm. but I have them back up, and there's... Uh, obviously, one of a young girl in a green dress, one in a red dress, mm -hmm. and then black and white. But the green dress is of particular interest. Uh, the Osage County Under Sheriff Gary Upton says that there is already a possible, a po already a possible identity for at least one of the women in these sketches, and it is the one in the green dress. Now, according to the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System or database, there. are Five missing women unsolved cases, five missing women unsolved cases from Kansas between Dennis Rader's first kill in 1974 and his arrest on February 25th, 2005. So still five missing women uh, from 74 to 2005. The, uh, only one of them, only one of them was last seen wearing a green dress. So investigators are now focused in on the sketch of this young blonde uh, in the green dress mm -hmm. and they believe it could be carol sullins who is the exotic dancer that went missing from either galena and i hope someone lets me know or galena kansas uh, and that would be this person right here uh, a real human being um to you dr joni johnston um you know, we had a therapist on, I think it was Dr. Roger Rhodes, who said something interesting because Dennis Rader is talking and then choosing points where he's staying silent. And you don't think of silence as control, but Dr. Roger Rhodes said he's manipulating the situation by purposely remaining quiet. Um, is that accurate, do you think? I do. And I think it is important. I mean, I'm so glad that we're that people are they're going through these photos, they're going through the, all the writings, they're evaluating, they're looking for evidence to try to corroborate, corroborate it, because I think it's important to realize you're right. He is manipulating the situation if he's saying nothing. Because if he didn't do any, any of these things, you know, yeah. you know, that that would also be significant, right? These families who, who kind of get lost sometimes in the whole you know, in the shuffle want answers. You know, they want to know who did 
murdered their ch their child? Where is their child? Where, why have they been gone for 30 years or 40 years? Um, so it, silence is, in some respects, the ultimate way to control the situation, particularly when you know people who are desperate for information and they think that you have it. Mm -hmm. mm. um, very interesting. Mac, uh, back to you on this. So when uh, Carol Marlene uh, Sullins, who we're looking at right now, when she went uh, missing, she was just 18 years old. She was only five foot three inches, weighed exactly 100 pounds. Um, she was she's never been found. But um, according uh, to investigators, two men were charged back in 2002, one of whom claimed to have accidentally caused her death. So there was someone that sort of came forward. Um, keep in mind that she was last seen talking to someone in a truck. And so investigators spoke to Carrie and this is out on the public record. Uh, and Carrie said that her dad was known to take solo camping trips. Uh, she said that to Fox News Digital. Mm -hmm. However, he never owned a truck until at least the mid 1990s. And she went missing, Carol, in 1991. So that's obviously the early 1990s, but um, what are you trying to do from a, a, a CSI, uh, a forensic standpoint, to try to put the pieces together? Because you have this one suspect saying, I killed her accidentally, and now you have investigators saying, maybe this is the girl from the sketch. Mm. Um, how do you try to piece it together so many years later? Number one, I want to know when he made that admission, and was it to make a deal? Because false confessions happen all the time. We've seen it in John Bonet Ramsey and other cases that are high profile. So when that was made is going to be critical. And the other thing is, can he tell you anything about where she is that we don't already know? So where is the dress? How did you kill her? Where is, you know, whatever you use, like, where are these things? Tell us the complete story. So again, if they can't do that, and they're thinking about it, and they're hemming and hawing, and whatever, then it may not be real. And again, offer a polygraph. You know, ask them to tell the story, then ask them to tell the story backwards. If they start leaving things out, then it's not from memory. And, and so, Mac, um, can we assume from what you're saying that investigators have gone to whoever this suspect is, obviously presume that he's still locked up, and said, tell us what you know, and they're pressing, pressing him? I would think so. But again, even before you did that, these folks are great manipulators. Nobody spends the majority of their life in prison where they come out where they're not a fantastic con artist. If you do not know more about him than he knows about you, and you don't know more about this case than he's been able to read online if he's lying about it, you're going to be found out within the first 30 seconds. So you can't go in there and play some good cop, bad cop from the seventies and act like you're going to strong arm somebody. You've got to go in with as much knowledge as possible. So again, the first question for me is she went missing on this date. You admitted it on this date a week before you were going to trial. That sounds like you wanted a deal. I don't sound like you did nothing. Or maybe you knew you were going to go to prison and you didn't want to come in here as a punk that stole a car. So you're trying to tell everybody, hey, I killed a whole bunch of women. But again, if you can't give me the details, then you're just a punk. Mm. Love to see Matt call that guy a punk. Uh, Black Widow says poses are rather doll-like, followed by JW, great initials, those are mine, uh, which he says the legs are important to him. Uh, interesting observations from STS Nation. Um, Dr. Ann Burgess, this is right in the middle of your wheelhouse, as Hey Mona says, love Dr. Ann's commentaries, who doesn't? Um, so they talked to uh, a media outlet, I think it was Fox News Digital again, spoke to uh, criminal profiler John Kelly, who I know you know of at least, and I'm mm -hmm. sure you know him. And he says that the uh, MO, the modus operandi, doesn't fit with, um, with this young blonde woman here. Um, and here's the quote from the profiler. And here is Carol Sullen's um, picture again, because she is a human being. Uh, this is what he said about this. And he said, these guys, meaning serial killers like Dennis Rader, have different kinds of victims in mind. And some of these guys, prostitutes or strippers, are just people from the other side of the tracks, if you will. They're beneath them, believe it or not. 
this is how they think. Is that accurate that Dennis Rader may not have touched this young woman because she was a sex worker? Oh, that's an interesting perspective. Um, looking at the victims that we know, uh, I don't think any of the previous ones were. Am I correct? So they, yeah. he hadn't, yeah, I mean, it's not like, uh, um, I'm trying to think of a, of an example. So that could be because it, he has no prior victim. They all were either a family, you know, the Otero family, or they were single victims. So from that standpoint, now, whether what the profiler said matches Dennis Rader, uh, we don't know. We don't know that whole 10 year period from the 77 to 87, a lot could have happened. And that I think is what people are looking at it, or even a later. Uh, his, his selection of victim was not in a sex worker uh, type, if I'm correct. And correct me if I'm wrong, maybe Mac knows more or at some point have to ask uh, well, Carrie wouldn't know, of course, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, what as far as I know, they were not sex workers. Yeah, um, that's what I thought. It, it, so it doesn't match. It's not a match. Yeah. And the drawings that he makes, the ones that I had seen, were all uh, certainly looked just um, regular girls, women, et cetera, but not older women. This one that you just said, the 31-year-old, that's, but that I do think matches one of his prior victims, age-wise match. Um, and, and, yeah. yeah, Dr. Joni, I was going to go to you on that just to get your take. So um, what about this MO? I mean, are serial killers, they, I always I always use the term OCD, which a lot of people correct me and say that's not the case, but they seem so specific in their killings. Um, would he potentially veer off the path and then go and kill a sex worker? Or do you think that's unusual? Well, I think it certainly, you know, is one point against this person being his victim. However, I will say when I was doing my research for my book and I did learn more about serial killers than I think I ever wanted to know, um, in addition to some of the, of the hands-on stuff I've done. But one of the things that was very, very clear is that while most sexually motivated serial killers have a preference, will have a preference for victim type, um, opportunity can play a, a role in there. So you can have mm -hmm. serial killers who say, okay, I prefer this kind of look. I prefer this kind of victim. But I have these urges, I have these sexual fantasies. And if I'm out, whether I'm looking for a victim or not, and the opportunity presents itself, I'm gonna take it. Right. So I, so while it is one thing that says, well, you know, this is out of character, it absolutely does not eliminate him as a suspect, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, Anne was letting me know, uh, she's Anne is back. There's a storm going on there uh, in the Boston area. So uh, bear with us, but... Um, Mac, to you, uh, the sheriff weighed in on these sketches. And the reason I'm keeping these up, I don't want people coming at me because the authorities really want help. And as difficult as it is to mm -hmm. look at this stuff, uh, that's why I've got this number scrolling the whole show. But um, he basically, you know, the sheriff came out, um, Mac, and said, you know, it shows three different women bound. That's pretty obvious. In sketch one, he says uh, what sticks out, one drawing shows what looks like a young female gagged and bound at her arms and legs. Officials are pointing to the black piping running through the barn walls. Uh, that's pretty distinctive. So you see that black piping. And yep. sketch two, it's the red top, another color drawing, uh, bound and gagged, uh, this woman in a red top. And the sheriff commented on that sketch saying, that would be a barn that had wood slats. And you see behind those wooden slats. You know, possibly a rounded post, but in that area of the barn, what would have possibly been a wooden floor, you know, and a lot of times intact rooms inside of barns or in feed rooms or in storage, they wouldn't leave a dirt floor because they didn't have livestock in that area. I mean, this is very detailed, the things that he's picking up. But, Mac, how important is that to maybe someone does know this barn? I don't know. I mean, I'm not a mid- Midwest or a country guy. So I don't know Barnes. I'm a Jersey guy, but um, how important are these details? They are paramount because again, he drew them. So when you start thinking, man, I wish we could just get inside of his head. There you go. He's given it to you on a silver platter. The young lady in the red, she looks like she's on her knees with her ankles crossed. 
if she were to collapse, it looks like she would hang herself. So there's your torture. You're watching it. She's going to get exhausted. I don't know what or who she's looking at, but again, she looks afraid, right? So he drew this from that angle for a reason. So is he got something else over there that's a concern for her? Or did he rig up that, you know, camera like he did when he took the pictures of himself recreating scenes and the camera took the angle of him talking to her? I don't know. But again, you want access to him. He's given it to you. The young lady in the um, green dress, the same thing. The shading is very dark. It's very deliberate. It's almost angry to me. Um, but again, she's sitting up. She doesn't appear to be harmed. She's bound, but she's not bloody anywhere. She doesn't have any bruising. She doesn't have any cuts. So again, what's going on with her? She's looking in a different direction. The victim in the center, again, she's looking in another direction. She almost looks like she's looking down, like she's given up, uh -huh. like she's in a much different position than the other two. The other two are clearly still alive. The rope okay. is not tight. So again, he's telling you, he's telling you what he's getting satisfaction and gratification from. Yeah. And Mac, you bring up uh, the third sketch, the one in the middle, the black and white. And uh, authorities said, uh, obviously, this was penned in uh, black ink and it shows an angle glaring down mm -hmm. at a female lying in a barn loft space. Um, right. He's bound by the neck to a staircase post. The staircase construction caught the attention of law enforcement. And the quote is, the support post appears to have a bracket and then a bolt that bolts through that to hold everything together, the sheriff said. Again, Mac, these are very, very specific details. But, you know, if you live in that area and you're a farmer, maybe you know something, right? Every, every child played in every barn in that county. So they would have recall. And again, no information is too small. If 50 people call and say the same thing about the same barn, then they're on to something. So call. It doesn't matter if you think, oh, they're going to think I'm crazy. Um, that looks like my grandfather's barn that I hadn't been in since 75. Call. Because when, again, we're looking at these pictures trying to analyze something, we've never been there. So it's critical if you have information. And uh, Dr. Joni, um, so Kerry spoke to CNN last week. It was an interesting piece. Shout out to Gene Caceres, who's a longtime crime reporter, does excellent work. Um, here's the quote from Kerry to CNN. My father did drafting at our house. He drew up plans for the gardens, Kerry said. And my dad needed to always be outside and be in the air. And winter was hard for him. And so we had to find things for him to do because when he got inside and he was too cooped up, he would get all angry. Um, I read that as a cranky dad. Uh, now, knowing who he is, how do you see it, Dr. Joni? Well, I think it is difficult because you're right. Most of us, we were talking about our fathers, we'd be like, yeah, he was kind of grumpy in the wintertime, or maybe he was depressed, he had seasonal affective disorder or whatever. So I don't want to get too um, you know, into the weeds in terms of, okay, now that we know the end of the story, at least well, we may not know the end of the story, but at least we know that he was, you know, murdered several people. It's very easy to kind of go, OK, these are signs at the time that something was wrong with him. And maybe it was. But I, I do think it's important to keep some perspective in terms of maybe this was just who he is. But I will mm -hmm. also say that I have found that people who are very controlling. Um, and I definitely think that um, Dennis Rader was somebody who was obviously very into control and domination, don't like to be cooped up for any reason. They do want to be in charge of the situation. They do want to go where they want to go. They don't want any confinement. And so to that extent, that makes sense to me. Can and I just, make one comment and just see what Dr. Ann and Dr. Joni think? Mac, you can make 70 comments. Go ahead. I appreciate it. This was way before the internet. And this is a time where if you wanted pornography, you had to either order it and wait six weeks for it, or you had to go to a specific store where they were living, I doubt they had a store anywhere near there. Some of these drawings could have been for his own gratification. He put his fantasies to paper because he couldn't get it anywhere else. Nowadays, you've got it on your phone whenever you want. But he didn't. He didn't have that bondage. He didn't have the rape scenes. He didn't have the torture scenes. So he could have drawn them. 
for his own personal enjoyment. And again, if you're talking hundreds and these are the ones that were recovered, Carrie will tell you there were places in the storage room. They didn't collect everything. And she has such an unbelievable memory that when they have taken her places, even though she didn't know the name of the county or the street, she remembers fishing there. She remembers camping there. So she is a money tree, we would call her. She is invaluable. And I just want to say again, what she is putting herself through to help people she doesn't even know is, I don't even know a word. I mean, it's beyond extraordinary to me to watch what she's doing. Yeah, and she just texted me, which is why I was looking down. So don't yell at me. And she said that uh, they've been working from before sun up to way after sundown. And they're just mm -hmm. going and going right now. So uh, they're in the uh, adrenaline uh, phase of this that Mac knows uh, all too well when they're on a, onto something with an investigative team. Um, and by the way, I think Mac brings up an amazing point. Uh, you got to put yourself in the perspective from you know, the early 70s to mid 2000s. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to throw my dad under the bus here and he just passed away, but, uh, find a couple of magazines every once in a while in the, uh, seventies and eighties. And, uh, that's mm -hmm. the way it was back then. Um, but Kerry Ross and, uh, Ann Burgess, uh, went on to say, my father absolutely loves barns and silos. Every time we drove around going camping, fishing, mm -hmm. college, he'd absolutely say this one. Like he said, I want to retire here. And he would tease my mom about it. And then after he was arrested, we found out later he had massive fantasies about those specific locations. So now we're driving around trying to find those by memory and noting them because we need to go see, is there anyone missing or buried there? Um, and if you come across other killers with a fascination for barns or silos or something of the uh, like. Right. Well, I think that that's a, a wonderful uh Tack to do uh, is to do that. Hopefully, she can go around. It can't be too large an area. I hope of, of what she's talking about. But I wanted to comment also on something Mac brought up. You know, back in those way back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the pedophiles would use Sears Roebuck catalogs as their product. Right. So right. Um, much of uh, what he drew did look like he could have been looking at a. Um, a Sears Roebuck kind of catalog of little girl mm -hmm. clothes or something and fantasizing. I mean, I think that's what, and then he would make his own, draw his own and whether he acted on it, we don't know. But I do think that the Barnes and the, his sketches of that and what Carrie says is quite important. And Dr. Ann, I think you're on to something. Cause my son, when I sent them to him, he said, it looks like the old, fashion sketches like a sketchbook like here's the yeah. coat here's the dress the way he borders and shades the way they're posed the lips are prominent the eyes you know he concentrates but the hands and feet he doesn't care if you look at from the 50s a you know a sketchbook from a designer they're very similar y'all and i think huck is onto something mm. uh, you know, julian I, asked, I was just said. asked Terry, does she remember any uh, catalogs being left around the house Good. Well, how do, how do like they that. buy their clothes? I, you know, I'm just thinking off out loud about what Carrie might remember and help with. I'm writing that down. Yeah, and that's the experience Anne comes with. Uh, Dr. Ann Burgess is my favorite guest, read her book, and it is good. Uh, you can say that again. Um, Dr. Joni Johnson, just back to this sort of barn fetish and silo fetish. Uh, do you find anything peculiar about that? Or does that just seem like, you know, you know, some people love the beach, some people love the mountains, and he loved barns. Well, it's certainly a place where you could have control over somebody and still be outdoors. So that kind of makes sense there, um, that he would, might be interested in those. And I just want to piggyback off what Mike said earlier. I grew up in Alabama, and let me tell you, I had lots of cousins who grew up in barns and playing in barns and that kind of thing. And I mean, people remember what those barns look like. Absolutely. It's been a lot of time. So I, I think in, in some respects, I mean, obviously the drawings of the, of the young women are important for clues and all kinds of things. But I think the drawings of the silos and some of those markings in the barns are also very, very important because they're three different barns. I mean, anybody mm -hmm. can tell that. This time it's not mm -hmm. one barn that this guy has a fantasy about that he's drawing different people in over and over again. They're very distinct barns. 
And Dr. Joni Papa Bear, who's in Moscow, Idaho, obviously the home of the uh, quadruple murder, uh, now a notorious site. Um, she says, imagine if this one uh, is an image of a family member that he killed. I cannot fathom that additional trauma for them. Um, what about the fact that these sketches that we're looking at that look like drawings, uh, these are real people. Um, and there could be family members out there right now who recognize them, um, who know them. And I've uh, been looking for them for 30, 30 some odd years. Uh, what would you say to the uh, to SCS Nation about um, sort of, you know, acknowledging that and realizing that these are people? Well, first of all, I mean, from the times I've been on your show, you have a very respectful audience. Um, and I really appreciate that and admire that about your, you know, your group, because Amen. people are very supportive of the guest. I'm very, very supportive of Carrie when she's been on lots of love and those kinds of things. So I think that's a, a very much a positive. And I also think it is so difficult because there are these competing, uh, you know, competing interests. And in so, well, in some respects, in the sense that you don't want to re-traumatize the family. And, you know, now all this has come out in the media and there's more attention being paid to these young women who have disappeared and that kind of thing. And that is can be re-traumatizing, especially seeing pictures and those kinds of things. At the same time, you want to bring justice for these families. It's kind of like families who sit through a trial after mm -hmm. their loved one has been murdered. And now they have to sit in this trial or they choose to to support their loved one and now hear all the details and see the crime scene photos and see the pictures and hear the testimony of how brutally they were murdered and those kinds of things. And you think that's so unfair or show up at a parole hearing every couple of years to say this person shouldn't get out. It is re-traumatizing the person and it's difficult to avoid some of that. So it's a matter of supporting, as you pointed out, just supporting and loving on that family and realizing that even though if they want to find out what happened, it's still going to be difficult. I would say best guess, better community. Dr. Joni, I got to ask because a bunch of people are saying, who's who's the guy in the photo behind you? Picture Alfred Hitchcock. You. Okay. Yes. No, Alfred Hitchcock. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Got some glare on it. Like, this is my community, I guess. Yeah. yeah there's, there's the answer. Um, <laughs> my movie community. Yeah. Dr. Joni, <laughs> back to you on this question. Uh, I brought this up too from Wendy B. And she's basically saying, why can't he just give it up? As Kerry said, he's rotting away. And it's hard for me to understand why he wouldn't give his daughter and the victim's family some form of peace. I asked this question and people looked at me like I was crazy. He's at the twilight of his life, obviously in bad shape. He's in prison. Uh, life expectancy is much shorter, as I learned today. Um, is it just the makeup of a serial killer to play these games till the very end where he's not going to tell people? I, I would. think... I'm sorry, yeah. Are you asking yeah. me? No, no, Dr. Joni, go ahead. And okay. get okay. Jump right in there. Um, I think most serial killers, particularly sexually motivated ones, feel motivated ones feel very little remorse and guilt over what they've done because in their minds they put these individuals in a box, um, and so they kind of stay in that box and they never come out. Um, I also think he probably wants to see his daughter again. Um, I mean, there could be a lot of reasons why he is not at this point wanting to give up any information that he has. Could it be a mind game? Yes, it could. Um, but it is important to realize that um, you know. People, individuals are complicated. And, you know, this is somebody who clearly has been diagnosed as psychopathic in the past. It doesn't mean he can't care about his daughter and want to see her again. You know, people are complicated. Um, and it would be so nice in some respects if they weren't <laughs> so complicated because we could just, <laughs> this is a black, this is a, you know, dark, dark, evil person. This is a, you know, and obviously this is somebody who's done very evil and dark things. Um, and so on the, on the spectrum, he pretty falls pretty close over to that dark area, but it doesn't mean he can't care about his child. And I think that could be a motivator if he has information, you know, why would he give it up right now if he could see his daughter again? And at what point does he realize he may not see her again? And I understand Carrie's perspective of, you know, she doesn't want to be used as a pawn in terms of threatening him and those kinds of things. So I think it's a complicated situation. But I have to agree um, that it would be so nice if he would. It would be so helpful to so many people in providing closure. I would just add uh, to what uh, you have said that don't forget that middle initial torture right and he is torturing he keeps torturing yeah. the families uh by doing that and we do know that some serial killers 
contact the families after they've killed one of their loved ones. So this is part of the of the pathology of, of a serial killer. So he's I don't think he's going to give it up unless there's some other exchange. I certainly would agree that he certainly has feelings for his daughter. That I don't think he's been able to cover over. And if there's any key, it's going to be her, I think. Mm -hmm. I do too. Agreed. And I agree with you, Anne, especially with this, not only the sadistic nature of his crimes, but also the fact that he loved taunting law enforcement. So you're absolute, I completely agree with you. He has a history of torturing people in so many different ways. So that makes complete sense to me that he would be using this as another avenue for that as well. Well, he, he did sob like a baby. Uh, Lucy, but when he saw Carrie, uh, Lucy Bell, uh, this is interesting, Anne. Uh, she says, it's interesting that the perspective of the viewer or the artist is beneath or roughly eye level with the victim or subjects. In my eyes, I would think that he would be above slightly, but he's below. Do you make anything of that? And uh, real quick, Anne, before you go, Mac and Joni, you know I don't want you to leave, but I know you guys have commitments. So whenever you need to bounce off, um, just give us okay. a little <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to try to get Ann to stay a few extra minutes. But Ann, what about this uh, perspective from slightly below it as opposed to above? He being so who's below he or the, so saying that the artist. So in this case would be Dennis Rader. So it would be he being. So he's looking up, up at the as he's drawing. Is Correct. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I, w I would think that they'd be, he'd be looking down because it's more of a power position as opposed to looking up. But do you make anything of that or am I reading into it too much? Well, it certainly means something. I, I I don't think you're reading too much into it. It's just that what do we know? What do we suspect he's he's doing? And that gives him perspective that maybe we're not aware of. Rather than looking down, he's going to be looking up to see a various a different part of, of what he's drawing. It's the only mm -hmm. thing I can think of without seeing the, the photo. Do we Joel know has, he, I'm sorry. Ahead. Go ahead, doctor. No, I just want. Do we know if he also photographed anyone, or is it just sketches? Do, do we know okay. that? Mac, do we know? Well, here's what I was going to say. Do you remember the photographs that they have released? It's him recreating the scenes. Yes. The camera's below. He's up in the tree. The camera's below posing as him. So, again, it means something to him. Everything about this guy's in code. He's a trickster. He's a con artist. He will sometimes give us a code like BTK that we can easily decipher and then he's going to give it to us anyway. But he's got all kind of writings and drawings that he, he's written in his own shorthand, so to speak. So one of the most obvious things he could be doing, he's probably not standing because he's self gratifying. I'll just put that out there. That's a <laughs> yeah. lovely thing, but you know, that's what he's doing. That's why these things take the time that it does. That's why it's all this setup and all this carrying on. It's all very sexual, but it's not fast. Yeah. And by the way, speaking of that, it was tough to hear Carrie say this. And she spoke very openly that um, mm. a blanket he used to murder one of the victims. Uh, mm -hmm. he took, and he ejaculated on that blanket. He also took it camping uh, with them uh, when they were kids. So uh, that's some of the things that she is no. dealing with that none of us can you know, even begin to know about. I'm getting nervous. I know Mac and Joni have to get going. So quick couple of questions and I'll let them go. And hopefully Anne will stay a couple more minutes. But L Rose, love the name from Australia. Uh, what if you had the clothing stash in these favorite places of his? He's been back a few times and we get right to uh, Mac to uh, Sheriff Erden again. He says mm -hmm. that the team uncovered and we know this now what Dennis Hi. Rader called a hidey hole. Mm -hmm. Um Bondage materials were among the recovered items. We saw that pantyhose ligature that was in there. And uh, now the county uh, sheriff for Osage County says that they're hoping state and federal agencies are going to intervene now uh, to check the DNA on some of these quote unquote trophies. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that needs to be done, uh, I assume, as soon as possible. And uh, how important could uh, these DNA DNA evidence from these trophies be paramount yeah. again a lot of people gave him a hard time when he you know was holding up the ligatures and things like that it was a excellent power play in my opinion 
he did several things all at the same time. The first thing he did by holding that up, the pantyhose where it looked like it would fit on a wrist or an ankle, he was talking directly to Dennis Rader. And he was letting me, you know, him know, we found your hidey hole. We're not stopping. You thought you could hide it. You didn't. The other thing that he did, any law enforcement, Kansas, Arkansas, Missouri, they now have something to look at where they can say, wait a minute, we've got something tied with the same knot. Y'all better call him. And maybe they had no idea there was any connection. And the third thing he did, he let all the families know we're not giving up. And to me, what he did was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And uh, here's a shot of uh, the sheriff holding that pantyhose ligature in his left hand with a, a glove on. Obviously, a shot at Dennis Rader, not looking too happy from a long time ago in court. And this is a, a screenshot of Kerry's old home where it once stood. It was demolished uh, after the arrest. But this is where they're digging. Uh, Dr. Joni and Mac, um, I appreciate the time. One more question for you, Dr. Joni. Does it surprise you this was uh, intact, nearly two feet into the ground, sort of a cement casing that he created? Um, I guess these trophies, um, these items of evidence are just so important to these serial killers, right? That they're going to, behind their family's back, go and create this special, quote unquote, hidey hole to keep these things in, right? It's that important to them. I mean, the, I think it was the most important thing in his life in some respects. I mean, I think he, it, it certainly was something I think he spent the most time doing and thinking about and planning and fantasizing about. So nothing would surprise me in terms of the elaborate nature of, that he might take to protect the things that meant so much to him. You know, one of the things just I mean, before Mac leaves, I wanted to mention is a proactive technique that I'm sure that Bob Ressler or John Douglas would have suggested is to get not necessarily the, the the rope or the bindings uh maybe get a, a separate one that looked just like it and do the interview the when, when talking with them and where it's in plain sight mm -hmm. uh, maybe a few degrees off and be able to have that there to see how much he looks at it etc and see if that in any way might loosen him up somewhat to to talk about it i've seen one of the cases that they did that's what they did it was a uh, i think it was a baton that the young victim had and they put that right on the table and uh, had set it up so that as he walked in for the interrogation that he had to go buy all of these items that would have been very obviously meant something to him so that would be a kind of a stress stressor type thing have you ever thought that that's that might brilliant honey i've been taking notes all night <laughs> I'm going to uh, go into a ton of meetings and take all kind of credit. Hey, y'all, I thought of something. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had to leave, Mac. <laughs> I, how could you leave? I mean, I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm taking notes. Dr. Joni says something. I'm like, oh, that's good. Dr. Ann says, oh, this is excellent. I can't leave. I, I feel like I've been to the best training ever. But I do. I just have to tell both of you how much I appreciate the two of you. Um, we just, you know, taking your time and talents and sharing them with everybody, include me. Again, I've, I've taken a couple pages of notes, so I just appreciate it so much. Well, we appreciate yeah, what you're doing for Carrie, too. I, I, I think you're going to see her, so uh, uh, please send her our best, too. I will do it, absolutely. So Good night, y'all. Right. Thank Thanks. you so much. Right. Thank, Thank you, Joe. It was appreciate a pleasure. Okay. And I'll update all of you. Thank Great. you. All right, y'all. Oh, oh, what did I just do? Uh, I just clicked off of Joni, and this is what happens when I'm solo. I mean, what did I just do to Joni? You've been working all day there, Joel. <laughs> yeah, and we just lost Joni, and I think that was my fault. So, um, Anne, can you stick around for a few more minutes? Sure, yeah. Uh, and and SDS Nation, do me a favor, and uh, it's time for to ask Anne anything. Hashtag ask Anne anything. Throw me some questions, and I'll throw them her way. Um, I hope I did not kick Joni off. Um, but this question, Ann, um, sure. could this be a sick ploy for attention from Dennis Rader as the 50th anniversary of the Otero family murders is approaching in January? I guess, how important is it uh, for serial killers to sort of memorialize important anniversaries? This is a big one. These were his first kills. Absolutely. That's a great, great question and a, a great job. Uh, 
thing to consider. Remember, they got him on. He responded to the 30th anniversary is how he started responding to um, when they wrote it up. He had to correct several things. And that started the correspondence with the they didn't know who it was at that time uh, back then. So with this being the 50th, I wonder if there could be something that he'd be able to read or I don't know how much information he gets where he'd have to correct them again and uh, see if they could could get him on something. That would be wonderful. But uh, it's not, it, he certainly has an evil mind. I will agree with that. Whether it's a sick mind, it's, it's his mind. And the, the important thing I think for us to do is how can we one step ahead of him and try to find out if there have been any other, well, I'm, I'm sure there have been other murders. It's a matter of can you link them to him? So uh, that's a task before us. I think that's what, uh, Joel, you're working on to see if some, certainly Mac, to see if they can get some leverage on this problem. Yeah. Someone's asking when the sketches turned up, um, he had been sketching back since the early 70s, but these sketches didn't weren't discovered till 2005, I don't think. But when they were actually drawn uh, is still in question. Uh, some really great questions, by the way, very quickly for uh, Dr. Ann Burgess. Um, after delving into such evil minds, how does Dr. Ann stay so positive, generous and kind? That's a good question. Ann. how do you do it? How do you do it? Oh, my God. Well, it's doing shows like this that you get the information out. You know that the work will go on. What else can we do? We have to get ahead of them all. I mean, these are the, the these unsolved cases. Look at how many have popped up just in the short time to try to think if, if he had any others. They've been all over uh, various states and certainly as well as Kansas. So and I think they only solve 60 percent a year. So you got 40 percent of murders unsolved, you just start adding that up even times 10 and you've got in each state and you've got 50 states, right? So the, the numbers really are voluminous that you have to um, think about. Yeah, we just, we just had a, a homicide detective from Chicago. Their clearance rate is only about 31%. And I had the yeah. police chief, a former police chief from Detroit when he took over, these are two of America's most major cities. Detroit only had an 11 percent clearance rate. So Anne makes a great wow. point. A lot wow. of homicides going unsolved. Abby Taha, friend of the show. Um, Anne, do you think that Carrie is going to be able to crack her dad because of their close bond from her childhood? It's a good question. I, if anyone can do it, I think she can, unless they're able to do some of this proactive work with uh, with him. I don't know what the parameters are but he may not be able to to tell her um i'm trying to think of who he did he finally confessed to the law enforcement so if they if he thinks they've got him he might confess to law enforcement as far as confessing to carrie um and and you're telling me that he was sobbing when he was last seeing her a lot oh there are the pictures are coming up now joel oh good so this is i brought yeah. this up because this is uh, by the way Cindy is spelled wrong, and I uh, admonish the COE, but she does a lot, so I had to cut her some slack. But she spells it C-Y-N-D-I, Kenny. Her real name is Cynthia. And uh, she went missing and in 1976. She was only 16 years old. She That's vanished from her... Yeah. 76. And she, she yeah. vanished from her... Her aunt and uncle had a laundromat back then. And they... Uh, the way this was connected is the Osage County Sheriff's Office in Oklahoma found out that one of BTK's journal entries was about victimizing, quote unquote, a girl or a lady uh, who he said was having a bad wash day. And they sort of pinned it to this laundromat. And uh, we're finding out a little more information that months after Cindy Kenny disappeared, the Osage County Sheriff's Office has now documented an anonymous call from a man claiming that the teen's body could be found in an old barn along the Oklahoma-Kansas border. This is pretty interesting, right, Ann? Because yeah, I'd he, say so. Yeah, yeah, he liked to tease people, play cat and mouse. Does this sound like his MO? Yes. If he, uh, Well, he doesn't trans... Do we have any examples where he transported victims. We know that he killed the first uh, family inside their house. Um, 
uh, I would always go back to the ones that we know that he did and see if there was any match there. Did he, but he would have to transport the person if he's from, would, would that have been when he's in Kansas and then he goes to the border, Oklahoma border? Yeah. And, I, but if I, he traveled. I, yeah, I don't know if he was transporting. Yeah. Um, well, you, you, well, the body would have to be transported unless. Yeah. Yeah. And was he working? That's the other thing is what was his work at that particular time? You'd have to kind of place it on his natural as much as you know his trajectory and yes. see so if one of the, any possibility. One, yeah, one of the other uh, possible that he's a prime suspect for is in this case with Shauna Garber. She went missing in. Oh, well, there she um, is. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say in, in Missouri, she went missing and. Um, and well, look at you. I've got a, a child picture of her. That is really interesting. See that? Yeah. The, the young child photo yeah. of her. Mm -hmm. um, but she uh, and I just she went missing. She was 22 years old, uh, was McDonald County, Missouri. She was raped and restrained with different types of bindings, which is a B BTK signature. Uh, her body was severely decomposed. Uh, the reason I brought this one up, obviously, we want to touch on it because it's a potential victim. But um, it turns out that Dennis Rader was working for the U.S. Census Bureau and was knocking on doors in this neighborhood right around that time. So that's a, a pretty strong link, potentially, right? Yes. Now. Yes, I would say so. Absolutely. And this is being investigated right now by a woman named Lori Howard. She's leading this cold case investigation in McDonald County, uh, Missouri. And her quote is, we're not sitting on our hands. We're doing our due diligence. She says she has an other suspect out there. Uh, with two witnesses claiming individually, separately at different times that their father killed uh, Shauna Garber. And it's not that we're not looking at Raider. We're just looking at the others also and where the evidence leads us to where we're going to go. She went missing right around Halloween 1990. So we've shown all these uh, victims. Um, this is an interesting question. A couple more and then we'll wrap it up because I know you've been. I just wanted to say you said once on something very, very interesting is he worked for the U.S. Census Bureau. What a perfect opportunity for him to get into someone's house, ask all kinds of questions that uh, he, you know, he would probably have a list. He could find out a lot of things. He could follow them. He could, you know, mark them down. I mean, that's amazing that that was the job he had. I mean, you see where he could have access and develop his own fantasy world and then maybe one of his uh, victims. Yeah, I didn't. Obviously, I didn't think of it the way you have, but it makes perfect sense. And it's a great way to track someone for yep. sure. Um, yep. Marie P says, is it possible he was somehow ashamed of these victims for sexual assault because he preached he was against that? And Anne, I'm not sure if you can see it now, but can you see these now? No, well, they're not coming up. Oh, wait um, a minute. There they are. Got it. Oh, OK. There you go. There are the photos. Yeah. So um, what about the fact that he could have been ashamed um, because of the sexual assault. And that's why he drew this. Is that a possibility? It certainly is a possibility. Um, uh, and it would have to do with how, what type of sexual acts he would commit while they got them tied up afterwards. Uh, it doesn't look like he could do it during if he's got them all tied up, but these are very interesting drawings. And you, yes, I, you can see how the two on either side, the blonde and the brunette, and the green and the red are very much younger than the one that is standing in the by the barn with the noose and so forth. And he has emphasized certain areas around her um, pelvic area. And he has her kind of, uh, it could be that he's saying, uh, like Glattman is, I just, I'm you're going to use these for a magazine or something, a detective magazine. And so I want you to look, look scared or to pose a certain way. And then he could have actually killed her. I mean, this is one, one possibility that Glattman, I'm just following what Glattman did. And, uh, but he certainly has a, a detail of the barn. Is that, um, I don't know enough about barns, but uh, it looks like the noose is hanging from something, which makes sense. But her, her feet, or she got feet. Let me see. I've got something that I have to move. Does she have feet? Uh, there you are. No, she doesn't. Uh, 
I guess you do. She's standing, right? Yeah, she's standing. So, yeah. but the uh, the two girls, they definitely are girls, whereas the standing is a a uh, certainly at least a teenager. She's yeah. uh, uh, different than the child. So, and I think he was into child um, child types of uh, fantasy. And certainly we know he killed adults, but we don't think he killed any children. Is that right? I yeah, think although the, uh, I killed one uh, part of the Atara family, but they think that that was because uh, it was a potential uh, eyewitness. Yeah. Um, so I think there was one child, um, mm -hmm. but you know, I hate to say it was kind of collateral um, in nature. Sure. Leave. I understand. Yeah. What is your, what do you think the girl in green is sitting on? Is that like a bale of hay? It looks like a bale, yeah, like a bale of hay to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's so the one where they said there's dark slats obviously behind her. And then yeah. the one in the red, there's like a wooden fencing almost behind. Yeah, yeah I would say these are the backgrounds are, are barns. And uh, Carrie was right that uh, he did have a um, he loved barns. And they are perfect places to do hidden things. Yeah. These are outside, but although that one may be inside, I'm not sure if that's an inside the barn or outside. I love watching Anne analyze in real time. That is a true <laughs> gift. Uh, not everyone gets that chance. SCS Nation is getting it. Two more questions and we'll let Anne go here. Um, from Ruth to Anne, do you think he's trying to get the spotlight off of Brian Koberger and, and the Long Island serial killer and back on himself? Well, that could certainly be. He would like that. He doesn't like, he likes the spotlight. I would agree with uh, Ruth that uh, he wants the spotlight on him. And he, he does like to, I remember the agents profiling him saying he would compare himself to other serial killers or other killers and have to be serial. So that, that could be, well, absolutely correct, Ruth, I would agree. And then uh, someone said, why would he, uh, why would he confess? He has nothing to gain. Um, I do not understand this question, so I'm not even going to go there, but I'm sure it is uh, smart. Mm -hmm. This is a question that I'm always interested in from Ski Hatless, Sarah, now. Uh, question for Anne, nature or nurture, what makes a serial killer, not spelled like the food we eat, but S-E-R-I-A-L. Uh, that's always uh, the $64,000 question. Was Dennis sure. Rader just born this way, Anne, or did he become this way somehow? Um, well, I, they haven't proven anything genetics, but uh, it, it's going to be, I think it's the the nurture part is, is important. He had, he was the oldest of four boys, wasn't he? Yeah. And so I haven't heard where any of the other three brothers were, I know one died young, but uh, I don't think, I think something that certainly got to him in his childhood and with that we don't know what it is uh i i it would take uh, some really good interviewing to find out what it was uh patricia burns another friend of the show psychopaths are by nature pathological liars and this is the only way he can stay relevant i think long island serial killer has put his nose out of joint so he claims he's done more i don't buy it we'll see uh, what happens but and after all these years, and you've got uh, many more in front of you, um, I don't know, are you still as interested and still as intrigued when a big case like this is breaking and developing, and uh, this is a notorious serial killer? Do you still get um, as interested in it as you did years ago? Oh, I get more interested because I have more more cases that I have now as backlogs they can match them against, so uh that's uh, I certainly am interested in any of them, and I use them in my teaching. I make my my student profile, see if we can add to the ranks, get uh, more people in, in, try to reduce victimization. That's my goal. Get them before they get as a number of, of victims. That's what it's so hard. Look, and you just mentioned how many cases are not being solved. So it's a huge problem. Um, she is the living legend, always gracious with her time. I wish I had as much energy as Dr. Ann Burgess. She is an internationally recognized pioneer in the assessment and treatment of victims of trauma and abuse and the author of A Killer by Design, Murders, Mind Hunters, and My Quest to Decipher the Criminal Mind. Uh, among her many, many, many awards and accolades in 2016, no one else can say this, she was named a living legend by the American Academy of Nursing. 
Uh, Netflix's Mindhunter, loosely based on Anne's work, as I said, Dakota Fanning is uh, creating a docu-series about Anne's work more specifically. Uh, Anne, any final thoughts on this uh, interesting night? I think it's, I, I really appreciate having the opportunity to see these drawings that look really come alive, if you will, when you put them on the screen and compare them with the, uh, to include the victims, so the two new victims that you've uh, identified, and especially the one that had herself as a child, that had a picture of her as a child. And I think this all adds to as our understanding of victimology and uh, hopefully make all of us much more aware of the of the problem and anxious to to do more about it. And media is important. BTK was noted for his communication with the media, and uh, I think that uh, we should uh, try to use the media in any way to to identify if there have been any more victims. Yeah, there's, there's the drama. Very. And there's very been cool. a lot of uh, discussion about number two. Uh, according to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Uh, she is, in fact, lying down. It's an overhead view. She's on the loft uh, floor oh, like, okay. top of a barn. So she's lying down. And I think Dr. Joni Johnston made the point that uh, the other two, red and green, there's a little bit of hope and possibility of being saved. But in uh, the black and white, it looks like, uh, you know, there was yeah. no more um, hope left in her. So uh, these questions are coming up, which is why I bring this mm -hmm. up. Uh, a special thanks, big thanks to Cheryl Mack McCollum. She's an active crime scene investigator for the Metro Atlanta PD. She works closely with Nancy Grace. She's also the co-author of Cold Case. And of course, Dr. Joni Johnston, who is a forensic psychologist, a private investigator and a crime writer. She wrote the book, um, Serial Killers, 101 Questions True Crime Fans Ask. You should go out and buy it. And she hosts her own YouTube channel, Unmasking a Murder. Every time I have Anne on, I feel great. Um, shout out to Kerry Rawson for all the work she's doing, and uh, we'll keep you posted. Uh, we're back live tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern time. We're debuting a new studio that I know my mom's going to hate. So tune in. She's going to be yelling at me after she sees it. Uh, I'll tell you why after you see it. Um, until then. Love you, America. Love you, Boston. Love you, Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, uh, San Diego, where Joni is, and good old Georgia, where Mac is. Until tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern time. And hang on one second. Sure.